Welcome to this Fertility Within Reach webinar, How to Mentally and Emotionally Prepare for Your Fertility Journey. I'm Jennifer Neely. I'm a Fertility Within Reach board member who will be moderating this webinar of distinguished guests who know each other. It's really <laughs> exciting to see them interact. I'll be asking questions generated by those of you who are part of this webinar now, as well as on social media. Just use the chat function here in Zoom or in social media, you can just tag Fertility Within Reach. Before we introduce you to our guests, we wanna let you know that this webinar is brought to you, of course, by Fertility Within Reach. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to increase access to health benefits for fertility treatment and preservation for all. Please visit us at fertilitywithinreach.org for information on how to advocate for yourself or get one-on-one -on -one advice or support. With that said, let's turn to our fabulous panel. I'm gonna ask each of you to introduce yourselves and I wanna start with reproductive endocrinologist, Dr. Nidhi Sachdev of OC Fertility, which is part of the CCRM network. Welcome, Dr. Sachdev. Hey, everybody. Hey. So I'm Dr. Nidhi Suchdev. Um, I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, as Jennifer said. I practice here in Newport Beach, um, Orange County, and I am interested in helping patients kind of manage their way through their fertility journey. So I thought it would be an awesome topic to talk about how to mentally and emotionally prepare for your fertility journey. Fantastic. Um, Let's move it over to Dr. Anita Patel, who has maybe a little bit different role than her <laughs> usual lab coated self. Dr. <laughs> Patel, welcome. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm Anita Patel. Um, I do happen to be um, a pediatric critical care doctor. Um, and um, I am also an assistant professor, so I do some teaching. Um, but why I'm here is I went through um, IVF to have my now four and a half month old child. So um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm very passionate about um, sort of disseminating knowledge about what it's like to go through um, this crazy but amazing process. That's wonderful. Dr. Sachdev, do you want to walk our audience through the sort of areas that you'll be uh, discussing with Dr. Patel so they can get an idea of what maybe they can expect and gear their questions accordingly? Yeah, totally. So there's some basic uh, um, outlines that we think we're going to talk about. One is um, how to kind of manage our expectations when going through the fertility journey. Um, and with that, how to manage your stress, because sometimes some of the stress coping mechanisms that people might use might be limited during um, their treatment course. Uh, and how to find a sense of community that can help um, navigate the journey. And then lastly, you know, what's some advice that you offer and how to advocate for yourself as you're navigating this journey and kind of communicating with your clinicians in, in clinic. That's um, fantastic. So we'll, we'll see how far we get. I'll turn yeah. the conversation over to you. If you have any questions, the last 15 minutes we'll be taking them. So feel free to post them at any time and I will reappear at the last part to uh, ask some of our guests. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, Anita, I thought that we'd uh, start off by just talking about your background. For many of you guys who don't know, Anita is a really passionate and um, vocal uh, Instagram influencer, if you will, um, <laughs> who, well, so, who talks a lot about uh, her fertility journey. And um, many people don't know, but aside from, you know, our joint interest in helping the fertility community, we actually know each other outside of this. Um, your cousin just happens to be my best friend. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> and we were just talking earlier about how I, I credit actually her to this webinar because um, it was her conversation that, uh, with me about your experience that her watching it. And she was saying to me, she's like, hey, Nitz, you know, like I, I'm seeing my cousin go through this. It's so interesting to watch her go through it. And it, it, it's so meaningful to see her experience with it. And we just started talking about things and it, it kind of a light bulb went off to me. And that's oh. kind of when I realized how important it is to, to share your story. So if you don't mind kind of giving us mm -hmm. the background. Not at all. Um, so my story is maybe a little bit different than, um, than some women who go through IVF, but I think actually each and every one of us has our own unique story, obviously. Um, but um, my story started um, because my um, now husband, at the time my fiance, um, found out that his sister had breast cancer. Um, and she's young, she's actually my age, so I'm, I'm 30, well, if you call us young, we're 37, but um, you know, she was young to get breast cancer. So um, she 
got tested um, for any uh, possible genetic mutations that could have potentially caused her, her really early diagnosis. And it turns out that she had the BRCA gene. Um, and, you know, she's very public about it um, and just a, a strong advocate for the community as well, actually. Um, and when she got tested positive for the BRCA gene, the rest of the family got tested. And um, unfortunately, my husband ended up having it as well. So um, once he got the diagnosis and, you know, as I mentioned, I'm 37 now and he's a couple years older than me. So we were already we knew we wanted to have kids and I am a physician. So I know your fertility obviously goes down as you get older. So even before we got married, we were already sort of trying to plan out when we wanted to have kids. And frankly, we wanted to have them as early as possible. Um, so this is where um, life took a funny turn of events and funny and fortuitous, honestly, because um, I actually happened to already be somewhat active on social media um, for two reasons. One was my hobby. I'm, I do a lot of yoga and I'm a yoga teacher. Um, but also I had found a group of physicians on social media. Um, and, you know, we um, sort of banded together to sort of help disseminate accurate knowledge about um, different medical topics. And one of my friends happened to be a reproductive endocrinologist. And I actually reached out to her never met her in person, but you know, we'd become sort of friend friendly on social media. And I said, look, um, my husband just got this diagnosis of the BRCA gene and I don't know what to do. Um, and one detail that I probably should mention is that um, this gene, if you have it, if one of your, one, one, um, if either the male or the female has it, it has 50% chance of passing it along to your kid. So it's not like 5% or 2%, it's I think one in two of your children are gonna, could have um, the BRCA gene. So she then mentioned to me, you actually have options. You have options to um, not pass along this gene to your child if you go through IVF um, and you basically make your embryos, genetically test them. Um, and by genetically testing them, you can know which, which embryos have the BRCA gene and then make the decision um, to implant the embryos that don't have it. Um, and, you know, when we had that conversation, I was shocked on many levels. First of all, that the science was so advanced that you could do something like that. Yeah. Um, and I was also shocked that I'm a physician and I'm not just a physician, but I'm a physician researcher. I've always been at incredibly large, super academic hospitals. As I mentioned, I, I do a lot of research. I have NIH grants and I had no idea about this. So when I found out that you could do that, I decided that I, I had, I, I felt a responsibility to share what I was doing um, with my social media. Um, and I also decided at that point that I wanted to share my whole fertility, fertility journey. I wanted to share every step of the process because I actually didn't know that much about it. And again, I realized if I don't know that much about it as a doctor, how do other people know that much about it? You know, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I have resources, I have friends, you know, I've got friends and, you know, who are REI doctors and I still didn't know that much about it. So, yeah. um, so we went through it. I shared every step of the way on my social media and um, through that became, you know, developed a, a amazing community of um, friends and, IVF warriors, and um, that's sort of what brought me to here today. And I also would be remiss not to mention that I got super, super, super lucky, and I now have a four and a half month old baby because of awesome. my IVF journey. So awesome. definitely had a happy, happy ending to a almost one and a half, two year long process. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So what's interesting is that, you know, I think it's awesome that you shared every aspect of it. You shared kind of the emotional aspect, it, the, the happy parts, the frustrating parts, the, the, the setbacks and things of that sort. And, and with that, though, you, you mentioned, I think, an important piece that although, you know, a lot of people may know about IVF, you know, there's a lot that you don't know until you're actually in it. Um, and so with that, I think I always talk to my patients. I think it's important to kind of manage our expectations from the beginning to understand what's the process going to be like. 
Um, you know, what can you expect? Can you just talk to a little bit about that? If you're offering, you know, the whole point of this is to offer advice to other people to kind of help them, you know, mentally prepare. Um, what are some things that you think they should consider or they should plan for when kind of managing their expectations? Yeah, I, I mean, so that's a great question. And honestly, I can speak to it as someone that maybe didn't manage my expectations so, <laughs> um, from the beginning. Um, and if and when, if I'm lucky enough to go through this again, I, I will. Um, and the first thing is um, understanding sort of the organization and process of your clinic. Um, understanding how many times you're gonna have to go in for appointments, um, understanding who is gonna be your point of contact, how often is your point of contact available? Are they available nine to five? Are they available in the mornings? Are they available all the time? Um, and also understanding um, what your contact with your doctor will be, um, because I very much realized, particularly in the fertility and the IVF space, um, that this is widely different. Um, and you know, certain clinics, you get to talk to your doctor every single appointment, anytime, any place. I happen to go to a clinic where, um, you know, my doctor was definitely managing. Um, my treatment and make, you know, monitoring, etc. But it was actually more from afar. Um, you know, I met with her several times before we went through the process. She explained everything to me, walked me through sort of what it was going to be like. Um, but, um, you know, they did also explain to me that my point of contact was going to be my nurse. Um, and I was okay with that, actually. Um, I met my nurse very early on. I loved her. And, you know, I did tell them, I was like, look, if I need to talk to my doctor, can I talk to her? And they said, absolutely. And that they followed through on that whenever I need, you know, it wasn't often, but if I needed to talk to my doctor, I was able to. So um, I think understanding who your point of contact is and what your contact with your doctor is from the very beginning is really important because you have options, right? As I mentioned, every clinic is really different in how they manage that. Um, and then I mentioned this a little bit, but understanding the timeline um, and understanding um, sort of how, you know, certain points of your journey are really intensive and you're going in, you know, in the beginning, every couple of days and every, every other day and then every day. Um, and, you know, I mentioned I'm a pediatric critical care doctor, so I really had to plan my whole schedule around the transfers. Um, and when you understand the timeline, I think it's also important to understand that um, there are certain things that are going to be out of your control. Um, and knowing that, you know, yes, you can rearrange your whole schedule to make this IVF cycle happen, but then there are maybe things, whether it's um, aspects of your own body that aren't ready for the transfer, or in my case, my, my transfer got delayed a couple times, or sorry, my, um, yeah, my transfer got delayed a couple times because the genetic testing wasn't ready. Um, so, you know, and that was, I remember the first time it got delayed, I honestly was devastated because I had planned my whole life around, mm -hmm. you know, this really rigorous schedule of going in for blood tests and shots and this and that. And um, when it got delayed the second time, I was like, you know what, this is, this is what it is. So I think understanding that you know, best laid plans and especially in IVF um, is it, it to no fault of anyone's things get delayed and um, knowing that that is a possibility up front, I think is really important. Um, totally. And again, yeah. I didn't realize that at the time. Yeah. So. You know, because people are always like, well, tell me, what is it going to be like? You're like, are the shots bad? And I say, look, the shots are intimidating. But after the first day, that's not going to be the issue. I think the mm -hmm. issue is the anticipation and the waiting. And, you know, because with every appointment, right, you're waiting to say, okay, is my testing okay? Or you're waiting to find out, well, you know, are my follicles growing? What size are they? Are, am I ready for my retrieval? And then on the other end, right, it's not just your schedule, because if you have a partner that's involved, then they also have to make sure they're available to possibly produce a specimen or just be with you or be by you and things of that sort. So I think the uncertainty, the, the understanding the uncertainty and uh, trying to have a better understanding of the range of which it's going to happen, I think, in my opinion, is really helpful. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I you know, when you said that I need to mention this too, you know, we were talking about clinic organization and timelines, but also just expecting sort of understanding and the range of how 
I was going to react to the medications yeah. I was taking. Um, you know, I, I know, and I've always been this way. I don't respond well to hormones. Um, and so I, I kind of knew going into it that I was going to have a hard time. My emotions were going to go all over the place. I knew I was going to gain weight. All those things happened. I knew it was going to happen. So it, it was hard, but I, I knew it. The one thing I didn't know until the day, um, the day after the day of my egg harvesting, uh, when that happened, I didn't know that you could have sort of a emotional downturn or, you know, just feeling really low after you stop the meds. Um, and I'll never forget it because one of my friends from social media called me that day and was like, Anita, I forgot to tell you, you may feel really low in the next couple of days. And thank God she told me that, you know, that that was a possibility because knowing that when I went through it, I was like, okay, you know, this sucks, but I know that it was, you know, this was a possibility and I know it's also time limited too. So also just understanding the spectrum of emotions and other side effects of the medications. Cause you know, they, for some it's, for me, it was really hard. And I have other friends that are, were barely even noticed, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think just understanding the range of how you may feel um, secondary to those medications is also really important. Yeah, totally. And I think also kind of just like understanding when you're gonna get information, right? Every clinic is different. When you're gonna get a call about how many fertilized how many did you have for biopsy and how are you going to get really that information? Um, again, you know, every place is different. There's no necessarily right or wrong way, but just knowing what to expect. Oh, am I going to get a call this day? And, and I think in, in my experience, you know, I would we'd much rather prefer that the patient asks rather than kind of assume or uh, feel like we're letting you down. As long as you're aware, if you want an extra call, ask for it. You know, people aren't going to say no, you know, we're yeah. always open to giving you information. I think that's key. Yeah. Um, an important thing that um, I think is important to acknowledge now is just in the era of COVID, the way that we do kind of all fertility treatment is different in that for many uh, people, if their partners were available, they would come to their appointments. Or if there's not a partner, maybe like a sibling or a parent or somebody, some sort of support would be at the appointments. Um, and because of COVID, we're limiting our interaction with people that aren't directly getting treatment. Oftentimes people are there alone, which can be really isolating and scary. Yeah. Um, especially because no matter how prepared you are, oftentimes when we're talking about information, the amount that's actually retained because of maybe the underlying anxiety or the, the fear or the, sometimes they're just foreign words um, is limited. And so I think understanding, okay, well, what is your game plan going to be? You know, sometimes during appointments, patients will call their, their parents or friend or their partner just so they have another sense of like what's going on. Um, you know, for new consultations, I think a lot of people prefer Zoom or w whatever telehealth that they're doing because their partner can be there. But I think it's important to understand that and what is going to be your mechanism, especially when med teaches. So I'll tell patients, and every clinic is different, but I'll tell patients, call, you know, whoever's going to help you or be your moral support during the meds and listen to the instructions or maybe FaceTime or whatever you can do so you have another sense so you're not at the time of feeling like maybe you didn't retain the information. Yeah, I I. 100% agree with that because I was super lucky. You know, I, I, I delivered in the time of COVID. So that's a whole nother story. But, um, you know, my husband came with me to every single appointment and exactly what you said. I think there were definitely, especially with the meds actually. And again, yeah. I'm a physician. <laughs> like I remember yeah. being like, wait, what, what yeah. cap am I putting on this totally, and that? Yeah. And, you know, yeah, just having, a, yeah. exactly. You yeah. know, so just having a second second person in whatever capacity is, is, you know, is super important. Totally. And I, and I think that all of this kind of leads into our, our next part, but I, I think an important part that I always tell patients is that, you know, fertility treatment, regardless of what you're doing is exciting because for many, you know, you're at a point where you're saying, okay, now I'm moving forward. Maybe hopefully I'm going to actively get pregnant because I'm doing treatment. But I think the key is understanding that with the treatment comes an emotional highs and lows, right? Because everything is heightened. You know, every pregnancy test is heightened because you have had several appointments and every phone call is heightened in every process. And so I think an important thing to acknowledge and a big part of why we're doing this is because people don't realize that, realize that the dropout rate from fertility treatment is quite high. There are several studies about it and the range varies, but, but you know, it can be as high as 20 to, to 50% of people will actually end up dropping out of fertility treatment prior to becoming pregnant. And a big part of it is the physical and emotional um, issues that come with it. And, and I always tell people that, you know, 
you know, my goal is to get you pregnant, but if I kill your spirit in the process of doing it, that doesn't help you, right? Because what if it's such a terrible experience that you get pregnant, but you're like, well, I have PTSD from that. I don't want to come back and try for a second. Well, then I've effectively changed the trajectory of your life, right? Yeah. Or if it's such a terrible experience or emotionally draining that you don't go, because the thing you got to realize about fertility treatment is that for many people, it, it, you have a good chance of it working. And the key is just having the ability to, to stick with it. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of talked about, well, one important thing for you is that given your background of being a yogi is that exercise is a way that you manage stress. Yeah. But, um, you know, I can't speak for all physicians, but sometimes I will advise patients to limit their exercise during certain treatments. And for a lot of people, it, that's really hard because they're like, well, how do I deal with this really stressful situation if I can't use my stress coping mechanism? So what do you, how do you advise patient, people? Yeah, so that was, um, especially during the egg harvesting phase, um, you know, they let me know early on, because um, I, I probably had mentioned I do a lot of yoga, they're like, well, you know, once you reach a certain point in, um, in your egg harvesting medication, like the pre-medication, you're not going to, you know, we, we'd recommend that you don't do yoga. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, um, I, I had to make a plan ahead of time because really yoga for me is a huge amount of therapy and stress release. Um, so I did a couple things. Um, I think the first thing that I did um, was really fall into the fertility community on Instagram. So I'd, um, you know, I'd announced I was doing IVF and I'd started to share, you know, I started to share every single shot and frankly, probably too much information on all the emotions I was going through. And I started to ask um, my friends, you know, what, what did you do? And, you know, they honestly, you know, some were like, I did meditation. Some said I allowed myself the grace of not exercising and accepted that I was just going to watch a lot of Netflix, um, you know, and so I had to sort of figure out what was going to work for me. Um, and for me, I ended up doing some research on are there meditations specific to patients going through um, their own fertility journeys? Are they specific? Because I had had some experience with meditation, but I was like, this has, there has to be something out there. And I did find something. Um, it was through an app called Expectful, and um, they had sort of directed meditations for um, people that were trying to conceive. And so I use those every morning and every night um, and, and they immensely help me. Um, and what I coupled with that though was really then I ended up making a text chain with a couple women that I had met through social media that were actually going through IVF at the exact same time as I was. So we ended up texting each other basically around the clock, you know, talking on the phone. So for me, it was a combination of these meditations. That was my time to myself. But also, I, for me, I actually really need to get out of myself a lot. And that was yeah. then me, you know, talking to my friends who were going through the exact same thing that I was going through. And that's what I want to emphasize. It's not like I had these friends before I went through IVF. I literally was on social media, sort of blasting it to the world. And, um, you know, I... I was blasting into the world as someone who showed my face and this is what I was doing. But in addition to the friends that I made happened to also be public about it, but there were others that, um, you know, in this sort of group of friends that I had that weren't sharing with the world that they were going through IVF, but they messaged me privately or, um, you know, there's some accounts where they don't show their face and, you know, they're still um, sharing their fertility journey. So for me, the community aspects, I, I still to this day don't think I would have gotten, I don't know, I think I would have been in your dropout rate if I hadn't had that um, community. Um, and um, really, yeah, that, that's what got me through it. And I did a little stretching, like safe stretching. I didn't do yoga, but you know, I, yeah. there are certain things you can do, but I did ask my doctor, you know, beforehand, like, is it okay to touch my toes and, <laughs> you know, things like yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, just getting their advice too was really important. Yeah, totally. I think, yeah, I think, I think that brings us to kind of, I would say like the, the kind of the crux of our conversation is the community. Um, and so, you know, we were talking earlier about kind of growing up, uh, you know, 
we're of the same ethnic background, we're South Asian, and kind of, I was kind of raised to say, you know, our, our South Asian community is important. And I, as I got older, I started to realize, well, what is it about the community that's important? And it's just, what is a community? It's basically people who are, have similar interests and you can relate to. And as you get older, you have a community, but I, I realized that sometimes the community you have may not be the right community for every aspect of your life, yeah. right? And so um, when going through something, although it seems relatable, oftentimes it's not necessarily that relatable, right? Going through an infertility journey. And even if someone's going through infertility, there's varying different degrees, right? Just yeah. like we don't treat every patient the same. Well, not everybody's journey is the same. And maybe somebody who's struggling to have their first can't necessarily relate to somebody who's struggling to have their second or their third, whereas each person's journey and struggles is real. So I think, you know, it's important to kind of find that community. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about like, you know, how you can go about finding that community, some advice you have to people who um, are just kind of like, hey, I want to find a community, but I don't even know how to do it. Yeah, so I think there are several avenues. Um, you know, the avenue I took was, was social media. Um, and um, I did that in a couple of ways. So, you know, I mentioned I, I decided to share. Um, but, um, and so in sharing, you know, I got lots of messages and um, ended up just chatting with people. And I think, um, you know, that was one of the big benefits of putting myself out there was that um, in doing so, everyone says like, oh, you're so brave for doing that. But I keep, you know, whenever they say that, I was like, I got so much help out of it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, got this community that was supporting me. They were invested in, um, in my journey. I was invested in theirs because many of them were going through it at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of how my community started. But, you know, I also, it's important to say that you know, just because some people decide to share doesn't mean that you need to. So, um, you know, you could be that person that is not sharing with the world, but you are looking on social media for those that are, and you reach out to them. And I, I promise you that most people will respond. Um, and if that one person you reach out to doesn't respond, reach out to the second person, because yeah. there, there are, there's an incredibly strong community of women and and men um who are going through their fertility journeys and they share because they they want to foster that community um you know it takes a little bit of courage that first time to reach out to someone it took courage on my side to reach out to people initially but then once you start um not only is that first step of reaching out just important um to start fostering that community, but then you're going to suddenly start getting connected with all these other people that are going through it. You know, in connecting with one person, I ended up connecting with another and then another and then another. And um, that just was, I mean, it, I, it wasn't just incredibly important for my fertility journey, but it actually truly in a lot of ways changed, changed my, it did change my life. Um, it changed the trajectory of my life. You know, I, in sharing my, that journey, I, I feel sort of empowered to share other things. Like now that I'm a mom, I share my breastfeeding journey. I share when I'm struggling with work, you know? So it just, it opened up a lot of things for me. Another um, one is going to your, um, the doctor that you choose, the doctor's office that you choose. So my clinic also has some support groups. Um, I had really thought about using them. Um, ultimately I ended up not just because I happened to um, find women that were going through what I was going through at the exact same time. Um, but I truly, if I hadn't found those women, I, I would have definitely, definitely, definitely used those support groups because they also- Dr. Dr. Patel, if you could just put your, your AirPod back or your, your oh, yeah, sure. there you Sorry. go. We'll be able to hear you better. <laughs> I think we heard you okay, but if there was anything there where you were talking about community um, and there's even community at your IVF group. Yes. Um, maybe if you want to restate anything around that. Absolutely. Sorry about that. So, um, so I was just saying that, um, you know, for those that are not on social media or not active, you know, a lot of clinics have support groups for women going through IVF and, um, you know, again, my avenue ended up being social media, but um, if I hadn't have had that, I, I definitely would have, I would have explored the support groups because I, I don't know how anyone goes through this alone, honestly, just because of 
you know, doctors and nurses are so good at, at preparing you, but it's just another thing to go through it with, um, with other women um, and men, if, if um, you know, other women and men that are going through the same thing that you're going through. So, um, so yeah, so, and then, you know, there are great organizations like this one, Fertility Within Reach, that I know connects people. So, um, you know, s just starting small, and I think with every step that you take to, to sort of foster and find that community, you're going to get one step closer to finding what you need. And I think it's truly a unique and unique process for everybody. Totally. You know, what I really like about the social media community is that there can be anonymity within the community. Right. Because, you know, you may be someone who wants to share, but like you say, you're not ready for it. Or maybe your partner doesn't feel as comfortable about you sharing because often it's together. And I like that you can be right in it, right in the thick of the community and feel like, you know, you're going through it with people without having to actually kind of say who you are or say what you're doing or what's specific to you. And I think that's really important for people because, yeah, you may not be somebody who, you know, feels comfortable sharing everything, but that doesn't mean that you, you're not gaining anything. Um, and, you know, and like you said, like developing those relationships with people as you're going through something as difficult as this is actually really bonding. I mean, I think about, you know, you know, like when you're younger, right? Like I remember like having one of my best friends in life is somebody that I became closer to because we were going through a difficult time. We were like going through a breakup, you know, and, mm -hmm. and like, you know, we, we have a set of good friends, but they were still with their significant others and we were just going through a breakup and that's what we bonded over. And we, you know, we would lay on the couch and listen to our Alicia Keys songs and we would, you know, we would be in it together, but you need somebody to be in it with you. Yeah. And that honestly is kind of what, what helps. And not just having that community, but it also may give you useful information to help prepare yeah. you. Yeah, right? you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I mean, I mentioned this before, but that, that emotional downturn I, you know, went through when I got off the fertility meds, if my friend hadn't told me that was going to happen, I think that I, I would have had a much harder time than I did. And I'd yeah. be remiss not to mention that, you know, I, I had a, Fun, a big group of a big community on social media, but also a sort of a smaller group of close friends that I made, um, again, through social media that we went through IVF together. And I still talk to them almost every single day. Um, we happened to also all get pregnant around the same time, which was totally miraculous. Um, we had been at varying stages of our own number of cycles, but um, you know, then we were pregnant together and then we had our babies together. So these truly, little so you know little reaching out on social media have turned into some of the closest friends that I've ever made um and yeah so it's it's just it's just amazing how little steps can really just change your journey um and just dramatically for the better totally and I like I we have we're lucky that here in Orange County we have a really great kind of um, curated uh, support group is called Infertility Unfiltered, which now is actually virtual. But I've had patients go through that and they, um, they I've had a patient literally say to me that, you know, I, I don't think that I was fully prepared prior to going through this until I went to, through the support group. And now I feel regardless of what happens, I feel like I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And it's the same thing because you, you learn from other people's experience. You learn, okay, you know, it, it didn't happen for me the first time, but that's happened to others. How do they cope? What do they do? What are things that they can do better? What are things that we should talk to our doctor about? Um, it's it's because it's all about ultimately that's what social media is about, right? It's educating and learning. And yes, you're finding a community, and the community helps you cope, but it also helps you educate you because the more you know, the more informed you're going to be, the better prepared you can be when you talk to your, you know, your providers, and then you can also help kind of manage your expectations, right? Yeah. No, which, absolutely. Yeah, which also brings me into our next to topic. I think is. Well, advocating for yourself. Um, and I think, I personally think that is huge. And I think that's where social media is super helpful because, you know, I, I personally believe that a big part of it is educating people, right? And by educating people, they can then understand what's going on. And, you know, I, on, on my end, when I have a consultation and the patient has some understanding of what I'm talking to um, what I'm going to talk to them about beforehand, it actually helps because then I feel more confident that they're actually going to retain everything we talked about because there's so much information that gets talked about in the hour and a half that I see them. And, um, and I feel like overall, those patients do better in the process because we can have a kind of a, a back and forth. Well, what do you think about this? And then I can, you know, respond in, in those sorts. But 
I have talked to kind of friends and friends of friends who've said, you know, I'm a little hesitant to talk to my doctor about this. What advice do you have? Yeah, um, you know, I actually have personal experience with this. So um, number one, I, I totally agree from both the patient and the physician side that, you know, advocating for yourself is never going to bother your doctor. Um, yeah. And I know this from both, both ends. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one, one example I have um, on sort of self-advocating for myself was, um, you know, I mentioned already that I, I don't respond super well to hormones. I never have, um, you know, I've always had a hard time finding a birth control that works. I just, you know, just things like that. I, I just, I knew I wasn't going to react well. And um, when I was, when we talked about the transfer, I remember my doctor mentioning to me that, um, you know, you'll have to be on birth control for a month. And it's funny, like the IVF shots, I was, I understood that was a necessary part of the process, but I, when she said that, I think it just triggered in me like, oh, I've, I've tried these before and I don't respond well. So I, I looked at her and I said, is there any way we cannot use the birth control for a month? Because, yeah. you know, I just, I don't respond well to it. And, um, you know, and she said, well, you do have an option. And that was the natural cycle transfer, which was sort of timing it based on um, my, my period, essentially. And you know, she, she did tell me that, you know, there's obviously more uncertainty with it, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, um, in talking to her, um, and I even talked to a couple of my friends who are um, reproductive endocrinologists, I made the decision that that was the right thing for me. And, you know, if I hadn't mentioned sort of my concerns and my history, I never would have even known about that option. Um, so I think, you know, when a doctor can't do their job unless you tell them all the information that you yeah. have about your yourself. And, um, you know, again, advocating is not arguing. It's, yeah. it's really making sure that you are making the most educated decision you can. And, you know, you know this way better than I do, but it, you know, it does seem like there are, are in some cases different options um, yep. and different types of medications, different types of cycles that people can go through um, in, in IVF and in other um, fertility treatment. So um, without sort of advocating and it, sort of explaining yourself and your situation, whether that's medical, whether that's social, physical, um, they can't help you. So I think my biggest piece of advice is actually what I said, that advocating is really not arguing. It's really just making sure that you're giving your doctor the best knowledge so that they can educate you so that you guys can make a decision. Because a lot of the decisions, I think, in particularly for the fertility world are mutual decisions, you know? Um, yeah. So, but yeah. Totally. And I, I always, you know, there's autonomy, right? Like it's, the, I think, in my opinion, the days of us kind of saying, this is what you're doing, do it or not there anymore, right? Like, you know, people are educated, more people are doing it, more people have friends who've done it. So you, you know, people know a lot more of it. And I think it's their right to come back and be like, to have a, you know, educated discussion and say, hey, you know, I have a friend who's doing Clomid instead of Letrozole. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Because ultimately, you know, and, and I think one way that I would recommend, like, when I have friends who are intimidated to talk to their doctor, I just say, you know, approach it from like an understanding standpoint, mm -hmm. right? You're not necessarily... You know, and I don't think that many people would feel threatened, but, you know, I think that's the, the concern that they don't want to, you know, like um, make their doctor feel like they're questioning what they're doing, but just to ask, to say, well, can you just educate me? You know, what is the difference between this versus this? And why do you think in, in my case that it's better for that? Yeah. Um, or I'll have somebody say, well, I had a friend who did this. Is there a reason why that we haven't thought about that? Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and I think that ultimately leads to a better um, kind of a better satisfaction about what's going on. Cause I oftentimes will tell people, I'll say, look, you know, I think the ultimate goal is that you feel like we're putting our best foot forward because then no matter what happens, we're going to be better prepared for the outcome yeah. and understanding why you're doing it and why your doctor is recommending it, I think is really important. And there are, you know, it's, it's an art, you know, this, right. It's a, there's an art to medicine and mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's kind of like just many ways to paint, to paint the sunset. Yep. And, um, and so I don't know if that made sense, but I said it, so I'm going to go with no, it. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I agree. I totally agree. It's right? A, and so, yeah. Yeah. And so, 
you know, I'll have patients say, well, what about this? I have a friend who does this and I'll articulate the reasonings why I'm not doing it. But yeah. and I think when they walk away, they're not, they don't interpret it as, oh, you know, this doctor doesn't want to do that. They say, okay, I understand why. And yes. if they, they, they're unhappy with that, then, you know, then they might find somebody else who, who would do that. And that's okay, right? Because yeah. ultimately we all have choices. So Yeah. And I think, in, you know, sometimes advocating is getting a second opinion. Um, and yes. that second opinion could be, you know what, your doctor is doing exactly what's right. And then yeah. you feel comfortable. But I don't think that any doctor would want you to be uncomfortable um, with a treatment regimen, especially when, you know, the stakes are so high. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. I mean, I yeah. Think, yeah. And I sometimes will tell people to get a second opinion because truthfully, sometimes it's not necessarily about what you're doing. Sometimes it's just when you haven't gotten to where you want to get to, sometimes just walking into our clinic, it just hurts. Yeah. And refreshing that and maybe going someplace else, you know, might, might help with that. And ultimately, you know, I would love to be the one that helps you get pregnant, but if you get pregnant, I'm still going to be happy. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what people have to get is that, yeah. you know, you have to do what's best for you. Or I had a patient, you know, I recommend, you know, you want a second opinion. She goes, can't you just get a second opinion for me? And I said, you're right. So I like asked, you know, like I texted a bunch of friends and we got some answers and we came back, but the key is just uh, autonomy, making sure yeah. that you understand your options. And I think that's key. Totally. Yeah. I, t I totally agree. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I think we're at about the time in which you, uh, to a lot, if anybody had any questions. So Jennifer, you want to? Yes, I will jump in. So um, just speaking to what you were talking about just now, um, you know, how much should people consider picking an IVF doctor kind of like a job interview. We get questions at Fertility Within Reach sometimes about good doctor fit. And I think that, you know, sometimes we see that the, um, the patient may feel like they almost have to stick with a particular doctor. There may be benefits reasons for that. But, you know, I think Anita, especially with your experience in social media, I, and somebody did ask, Lisa had asked, how you picked your clinic, and if you looked at the SART data, which I'm guessing that you did, um, but but it all kind of goes hand in hand. I'm wondering how much social media might have helped you find your doctor to begin with or not, and you know how much you look at, you know, D Dr. Satsdev, for you, how much you look at, I know you do a lot of educational material online on, on OC Fertility's Instagram, your own, uh, how much that's important to both of you from each of your perspectives? Um, so, I mean, I could say truthfully, yeah. I mean, I think when patients come to see me to, to some degree, it is like an interview, right? I mean, because you have to make sure that you feel comfortable with me. And I think an important question, and I've actually had a lot of patients ask me this, which I like, they say, well, what, how is the communication going to work? What can I expect? Kind of like what we talked about in the beginning, what to, what to expect. And then we, you know, I give them a breakdown of how it works, you know, who are you going to see when you come in? How often you're going to see me, you know, who's doing your procedure kind of deal and what the time frame is. And I think that's important. And I, and I do think that finding a doctor that you like, and for many people, you know, the, the connection with their doctor isn't as important and which is, you know, which is a lot of people. Um, and for some people it is some people, you know, we develop almost like an emotional relationship to our doctor. And so I think that's important in assessing uh, that vibe that you get with them. And, and truthfully, the clinic, Right, like you know, I could be an awesome doctor, but really, it's it's my it's my team that that makes the experience. And so, I think um, kind of getting a, a general sense of how you feel, not just with your doctor, but with the clinic and how things run, um, is important. Yeah, Dr. Patel, I, mean, I can. How did you pick your that. clinic? Yeah, it's a great question. So, a couple different things that I did. So, the first thing um, was I did ask um, a couple uh, doctors on social media um, that were were REI doctors. I said, you know what, I'm in Washington D.C. Um, what are the best clinics? Um, so that's how I started. I, I they gave me one or two names um, of clinics. The next thing I did is I looked at the data, <laughs> obviously. So I wanted to look, look at the SART data. I right? looked at the SART data because I wanted to make sure that whatever clinic I went to had a good track record. Um, that was, I would say, you know, for my, the first thing I did, as I said, was what is the community, the REI community saying are the good clinics? That's very important. Um, but then I also just needed to look at the data to make sure that they had good results. Um, and then 
The third thing was when I sort of had decided, okay, I'm going to try this particular clinic, um, really is what um, Dr. Sashdeep said. You know, I, I went to my appointment, I chose my doctor, um, I, did, I did do research because our situation was a little unique, as I mentioned, with the BRCA gene, and I wanted to go to a doctor that um, had experience um, with sort of this particularly genetic testing um, of uh, breast cancers. Um, and there happened to be a doctor at the clinic that, um, that had experience with that. So um, I made an appointment with her. Um, and from that, um, it's exactly what, what Dr. Sashdev said. I wanted to see if I felt comfortable in that clinic. Like, did I like the person at the front desk? Obviously, did I like my doctor? Did I like the nurse? Um, and once I figured out, once they explained to me sort of who I'd be seeing on a regular basis, although for me, my, you know, my connection with my doctor, I realized was perhaps less important than how much I trusted her medically, because I wasn't actually seeing her all the time. Um, and in seeing and sort of having two good thorough appointments with her, I realized I very much trusted her medically. I liked how she communicated with me because she communicated with me, you know, very in a very medical way because she knew I was a physician, right? And that would not be right for other people probably, yeah. but it worked for me. Um, and I really, the one thing I really liked, well, a couple things is I liked how the clinic run it kind of felt like a factory, but like a really good factory. <laughs> yeah. Like I knew when I went in that I was going to say hi to the unit desk clerk and then I was gonna go sit down and then they were gonna put me into a room. Then I was gonna get my blood drawn. Everyone was super nice and warm, but it was also like, you know, a well-oiled machine. And it's funny because I, I, I would be remiss, remiss not to say that to me, I really like that because I like, I'm, I like to know what I'm getting myself into. I like, I also like to just chat with people. So a friendly environment's important to me. But I remember talking to a, another friend who was about to go through IVF and she started at the place that I did and was like, I don't like this place. She's like, it feels <laughs> like a factory to me yeah. in that, you know, it's like mm. this well-oiled machine. So, you know, if you need a personalized touch, that's really important. For, for me, I, I needed to feel comfortable there, but I also really wanted it to be a well-oiled machine and know what I was getting myself into. So, um, totally. so yeah. And I also would, like the, the nurse, because I, I knew that the person I was going to be talking to every day really was the nurse, and I, I absolutely loved my nurse. Um, and that was also really important to me. Um, having a connection with her, I realized was actually maybe in a way more important than my doctor. So, yeah, totally. so, so yeah. So understanding the the lay the lay of a clinic is really important because you will be going there a lot. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and some a bigger clinic will have multiple locations, and that works better for some people who have really specific schedules. Right. If you have to be at work by a certain time and you need to be have options to go many places, that's something to consider versus if you're looking for something that's smaller, then you may want to go to a more boutique practice that has fewer doctors and fewer people. Right. So it's just, Absolutely. It, you know, it, it's just personal preference. Yeah. And since you mentioned that, you know, I ha like my husband was able to come with me to all my appointments because he worked across the street from the clinic. So oh, for yeah. me, it was really important yeah. that he come with me. I, I knew I needed that support. Um, so I also, you know, the locate, I happened to go to a practice that had a lot of different locations and yeah. he was able to come with me. So, yeah. Well, I want to turn to a couple questions that relate to some of what you mentioned before, Dr. Patel, in terms of mental health, um, or, or they're, or they're adjacent to that. So one person has asked here, how can you stay positive while you know the success rate with either IUI or IVF? Yeah. Um, the question. way that yeah is a great question. So there are a couple ways that I stayed positive. Um, I think first and foremost was the community, um, and again that was for me the social media community, um, and also in through that community I so particularly one of my closest friends now who I literally talked to just a little bit ago, Melissa Parsons. She's on social media and she went through, I, I can't even say, how, I don't know how many cycles, um, many, 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 many cycles. 
Um, and she has a now five month old baby boy. Um, and, you know, I think Dr. Sasha, you, you touched on this, you can find success. You just have to be persistent and, um, you know, having examples of people like that who were persistent, um, didn't give up, um, helped me to stay positive. And also it goes back to the expectations part. I didn't expect that it was going to be successful the first time, but that was, didn't take away from my positivity. It just made me, number one, go into this with realistic expectations, but also go into it knowing that I wasn't going to give up. Um, and I think that combination of reality and persistence is what helped me to stay positive. And I also just want to say that I wasn't happy-go-lucky the whole time that I went through this process. And I think that's important to say because I think having an overall positive outlook, yes, is important. But putting that pressure on yourself to stay positive also can sometimes be detrimental, you know? And yeah. um, that's one of the parts of social media sometimes I don't like as much is that you, some, you might see someone smiling in every picture and you're like, well, why am I not smiling through my yeah. fertility process, right? And that was part yeah. of the reason why I, I shared what I did because you don't, you know, I was not happy every day. <laughs> I promise you I wasn't. Um, but I did feel positive that if I stuck with it, that it would work. Um, you know, even with sort of the genetic history and all the steps we had to take, um, I, 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 I had the resolution we were going to do it. Um, and the acceptance that there would be points that were not not fun and and that's okay because i was focused on the goal um and i think that's where community really helps um sorry jennifer to interrupt but i think that's no, where community I was, helps because sure, I, yeah. i've had i've had patients say okay well this is hard but you know i was talking to my friend who's been through this and she had a similar situation or i know somebody who's who's you know who's had who's had to go through it more times than me and i think that helps with kind of Yes, managing your expectations by staying hopeful, right? If you have somebody who was able to stick to it, just like you mentioned, and then they ended up with, uh, you know, a positive outcome that gives you hope. Yeah. Um, and I think that's so, why community is so important. Yeah. Dr. Sachdev, I also wanted to, to see on the other side of that, and from a clinician's point of view, you know, Dr. Patel is a doctor, so she can she's used to dealing with data. How do you work with setting expectations around success rates with you know, say people that are 40 plus or, or that are, you know, there are real data, there are limits to biologically to what our bodies might be able to do at any given point in time where you as doctors might have a different way of framing that. So maybe with creatives or people whose minds may not think in the way that yours do, do you have a, a, any advice for them into how to approach their, their meetings with their doctor initially so they know it's a good fit? Yeah, so I mean, I think the key is that, you know, as a doctor, it's our job to kind of explain to you the risk benefits, right, and the potential successes in statistics, right? Like, and what I tell patients is that, you know, it may not be a direct answer to your question, but in general, when I tell patients, like, I'm giving you a percent chance of this embryo implanting, whether it's 65%, 70%, or 50%, but ultimately, that end result is going to be binary, right? Zero or 100%, you're going to leave with your end goal or not, right? Even though you may have an implantation lead to a miscarriage, that's not what you came for. You, you have a binary goal. So I'm gonna give you all these, um, you know, all these statistics, but you have to understand that, that they're numbers. And a lot of these statistics are applied, are looked at a pooled data, right? A bunch of 40 year olds, a bunch of 42 year olds, and it's hard to say specifically to you, but we, we look at that and then you kind of internalize it and say, okay, you know, am I okay with this, right? Like, am I okay? pursuing treatment on, on the chance that maybe, you know, you can look at it both ways. You know, there's a 15% chance it'll work um, or an 85% chance it won't work, right? But somebody's going to fall into that 15% category. And if you're okay trying at the hope that you will be, then I, you know, I think that's kind of the way to approach it. Um, and that, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we talk to patients about many different things and that there's many different ways to build a family. So, you know, if you, if you stick with it and, and you, that you're committed to it, you know, over time, there are different ways that, you know, you may not be, to get from A to B, it may not be a straight line. It may be a windy road, but, you know, if you're willing to, the odds are that you might get there. One question that I actually, Dr. Patel, you, you might have a really interesting answer to this one, given that you're a yogi, how to deal with the side effects of meds or how to get rid of weight gain from all of the meds. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, 
side effects of meds, for me, the meditation really helped. And um, I would, I also just want to mention that, and I make no money off of this, so I'm just going to say that up front. Um, after going through my IVF journey, um, I, I loved the, the meditations I found with the Expectful app. And I actually reached out to them and said, you guys need to make um, specific meditations for people going through IVF. <laughs> um, and they're like, great, help us make them. So, um, you know, now they have a whole set of meditations that sort of support you in every step of your, of your actual like IVF journey. Um, so for me, finding those meditations and having like, just having a, a game plan for every day I was going to do a meditation and these, you know, five minute meditation in the morning and a five minute meditation at night was profoundly helpful. Um, what also really helped me too um, was my husband, um, and if it's if you don't have a partner, it can be a friend or, you know, we made every injection as fun as possible. So, um, and if you look at my social media, I can say at the end, you know, he would literally play music when we would do our, our injection shots. He would film me and we would dance and do the shot. And, you know, it sounds really silly, but just like making the process in whatever way you can sort of fun or silly, um, that really, really, really helped me. And I noticed it because, you know, there are several times when I had to be at work to do my shots and when I didn't have him to sort of have that fun, fun time, you know, they, it was, it was a lot harder. Um, so I think just trying to inject a little, for me, it's humor for you. It might be good songs, you know, things like that. Just trying to personalize the journey in some way. Um, I think, I think that's really a helpful. great tip because I know with, Another event we did that I had the pleasure to host with Elliot Cronenfeld and, and Andrea Sertash of Pregnantish, you know, there is that, this, that sort of thing with your partner helps with the intimacy that you're, you may need to look to lean into or regain after a birth. So that can be really helpful. Did you have any thoughts about the weight gain? I have you, have, oh, how yes. are you approaching that, that as you, um, you know, as, as these only these few months have gone by, but you know, yeah. especially with COVID, it's, it's a little, little yeah. different. So I do have um, something to say about the weight gain. So I gained about 10 to 12 pounds. Um, and I didn't mention this before, but I actually did the egg harvesting prior to getting, to, prior to my marriage. Um, and I had to come to a place of acceptance with the weight gain personally. Um, I was still doing my yoga every single day. Um, I got a Peloton bike. I was doing my Peloton. And for me, it took, I actually didn't lose the IVF weight until like, and I, I didn't lose it and ended up being sort of over my baseline for my marriage. Um, and as I said, like, you know, that I, that's how I respond to hormones is I sort of hold on to the weight. However, um, you know, post-pregnancy, I, I lost all the weight really quickly. So, you know, and, I, and that's just been through doing what I can. And I think the major way that um, I never gave up my sort of workouts, even when I wasn't losing the weight um, after initially going through sort of the egg harvesting and transfer, you know, I kept going because it helped me mentally. And there were many times during my pregnancy, I couldn't work out because I was sick or this or that. But post-pregnancy, as soon as I was cleared to work out, I have been. And some days it's 10 minutes and other days it's 30 minutes. But I, I set a goal for myself of four to five days a week. And no matter what, no matter even if I have, I have a 24 hour shift tomorrow, so I'm going to still do it. You know, I, I make, I make, I set goals for myself and I make it. And I think now that I'm off all the hormones and I've sort of let go of the expectations of losing weight, it has come off. So I think knowing your body, knowing how you respond to hormones. Um, I, I knew that going into it and I accepted that the weight was probably not going to come off until I was off the hormones. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and for me, it just happened to be after pregnancy. <laughs> I love that your questions are so real. You always answer so authentically. <laughs> Dr. Sachdev, I'm sure you hear from your patients who graduate to motherhood. Do you 
have advice or do you provide, um, you know, do you have any thoughts around this? Yeah, I mean, I say, you know, I say don't focus on the numbers, right? The focus on being in a better, healthier place. And I say this to someone, whether they've had a baby or whether they're trying to get pregnant. Um, and, it, you know, obviously it's hard once you've had a baby, you know, one, your body is different. It's changed. You have to wait six weeks at least. So you start working out and then, you know, you might be up at all hours of the night and you're exhausted. But I think it's just focusing on trying to be healthier. Um, whether it's like you said, setting goals for yourself, 10 minutes, five minutes, doesn't matter what it is. If it's just arms, if you can't do cardio or something, if it's just standing up, you know, like, you know, stretching your body, anything, set goals for yourself and start slow and don't focus on the numbers, just focus on being healthier. I think that makes it much more manageable. Any online communities that either of you would recommend to that have this similar mindset as a fellow yogi and a yoga therapist in my sort of free time? I know there are those that are kind of um, really goal driven, but in a, in a realistic way, where slow and steady wins the race, which is what I kind of hear from both of you and others that maybe you're a little about the image and the visage to the point where it might, it might compromise people's uh, sense of self. I just wonder, you know, cause this again, you know, Dr. Patel, you talked about the extremes of social media. I wonder if either of you maybe could point folks, uh, and this is our, our last question. Unfortunately, we'll have to get to other questions in a, in a separate setting, but, but, could either of you address um, kind of healthy mindset? Because we know that so much, that may be very much Dr. Patel part of what made it successful for you. And I know Dr. Sachdev, you talked about mindset being so important. You've seen that change outcomes for patients. So maybe I could, each of you could address that. Oh yeah, so post-pregnancy for me, so during my fertility journey, um, when I wasn't on the medications, I continued what I normally did, which was yoga. And I, I happened to go to a yoga studio. So it's difficult for me to point there. But post-pregnancy, um, I really, I use the Snapback. And again, it's not sponsored by any means in any way, shape, or form. But um, I really liked the Snapback personally because um, it didn't focus at all on weight loss or your body, it focused on sort of strengthening yourself slowly and steadily from the inside. And it, you know, frequently in this app kept saying like, do not weigh yourself, you know, just, just do these. And the exercises, when I say I did a five, 10, like 10, 15 minute exercise, they were actually the snapback. Um, and so they were also sort of realistically curated for a mom who has a newborn that's bothering you every five seconds. So I'm not bothering Perfect. you. Know, you know what I mean? So, so, so yeah, so that really helped me a lot. I like anything that's guided. So, you know, like I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not an athlete by any means, but when I tried to start running, um, I would do like a guided run. And even if you're not really running, even if you're walking, it kind of helps guide you and keep you on pace and keep you on target. So there's a bunch that are free. I happen to use the Nike run club just because that's what my husband had. So that's what I did. But there's a bunch, you know, and they, you know, Headspace has some. And so I think anything that kind of keeps you, it's all about mental stamina, right? Keeps you from veering off mentally to be like, oh, I'm done. Just to keep you going, I think, um, in my opinion, is really helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. That's such a wonderful button up to the end here. Dr. Patel, if folks want to reach out to you from this webinar, how can they find you? Yes, yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. As I have mentioned many times, I'm at Anita K. Patel MD um, on Instagram. So I think that's the easiest way to reach me. Wonderful. Dr. Sachdev, how can we find you? Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, my practice is OC Fertility. Um, our website is ocfertility.com. And then on Instagram, I'm at Dr. Nidhi Sachdev. Uh, but you can reach me, feel free to send me a message or you can reach out to our clinic. Fantastic. And I know you do a lot of videos online as well. It's been great. I can't thank you both enough, your, your chemistry and, you know, you sharing a, a very special person in common has, you know, led to a warmth that really comes through. For all of us at Fertility in Reach, uh, we thank you so much for coming to this event and we hope you let your friends know about it as well. We'll see you next time.